screen. Yeah. Uh, let's let's try to do that. Um, so you've been made co-host, so that should be fine. Okay, you should be able to see my uh, yes. my slides, and I'll switching them to the presentation mode. Wonderful. So, Peter, yeah. thank you for taking the time out, and uh, even at this unearthly hour, coming to talk to us, and uh, we are really looking forward to hear uh, your talk. So, over to you, and thank you again. All right. Uh, well, welcome everybody. It's great to. Uh, Great to see uh, a lot of interesting people, actually, at least a lot of interesting names. So far, it's all black boxes. Uh, and uh, it's kind of nice to do it virtually. On one hand, you don't see faces. On the other hand, people can come here from the whole the world. So uh, this is the university I'm working on. It's the University of Pittsburgh. Just and I'm a professor uh, of information science and intelligence systems. And my background here is the Cathedral of Learning, exactly that building which you see here is the tallest educational building in the Western Hemisphere. So my alma mater, Moscow State University, is a bit taller. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the uh, data-driven education. And this, so my, the, the way to do a right talk is to get users shocked with something, show something exciting or something scary. I'll do the scary thing. Does it look scary? No? Yes. Yeah, well, at least five years ago, it was looking really scary because we as faculty in various universities thought that these MOOCs, they're just going to kill us, right? Everyone will take MOOC, nobody will pay at our university, we'll be like jobless. Fortunately, or oh, I don't know, unfortunately, it turns out that it's not really a free, uh, a free ride with MOOCs, they have a big thing. And this big thing, our big issue is, has been at that time recognized as a completion rate. Yeah, MOOC kind of do it, but it doesn't quite work for everyone. So in the early days of MOOC, and even right now, uh, the completion rate of MOOC were miserable, right? If every if a university will give completion rate of students through courses like that, they get out of business. So uh, bare, rarely a MOOC can get over 10% completion rate. The most famous MOOC of all time uh, was uh, Scala language. The, uh, offered by the developers. That was 20%, 20%, right, the, the, the record. But again, just think that in your class, 20% of student retains, you'll be fired. So um, that was really a big puzzle uh, at the time, given that MOOCs has been generated by really top universities, Stanford, Caltech, Princeton, and they're offered by the top faculty, right? Top colleges, top faculty, great content and very nice platforms. And it's all was free, not anymore, but at the time, why the hell is such a low retention rate? Okay, that's exactly what uh, changing this uh, whole research uh, direction of work. Uh, Data-driven learning has been popular before, but this MOOC issue uh, becomes on one hand a challenge, on another uh, hand an opportunity because now we actually have data. We have no idea why students are dropping out, but we have data. MOOCs are recording everything in details and on a larger scale. If your MOOC has 200,000 students and the students might have uh, thousands and thousand clicks on the course, you have huge volume of data. So the idea was, well, that's kind of new generation of learning. So we finally figured out what is happening. And in particular, we can find out why people drop out. How we can get them learning better? How we can personalize learning? And in fact, not just that, how we can learn more about how humans learn, how we can learn more on how to teach better. So that was really looking all exciting. So human learning is combined with machine learning. Humans learn and they produce data. Machine learning churns through this data, a large volume of data and do something to improve human learning. And that's getting us higher and higher and higher. So that's what, in fact, data-driven education is. Uh, there is a lot of things going on there. Uh, I'll just going to talk about a few things. Uh, all of them are similar in one main goal. So the, the attempt is to use all of this huge volume of data, the treasure of data left by past learners in some ways, so it could help future learners. But it can be done by multiple different ways. And uh, for me personally, there is a real big difference in who is going to leverage this data, who is going to make sense of that. And I really see two main uh, direction of uh, work in this field and community behind them and conferences. 
and they are a machine-centered approach. Data going to be leveraged by AI, by machines, and that's usually known as educational data mining, also sometimes learning analytics and things like that. But there's also human-centered approach. Don't feed that to algorithms, feed it to humans in some way. So maybe humans will make sense of that. And that is known as visual learning analytics, which also kind of was really popular. And I'd like to show you a little bit of examples of that uh, two, two important approaches. But first, a brief introduction to two directions uh, of work, uh, because that's, that's, that's a way to classify uh, all of the variety of work. So educational data mining, what is going to achieve? Uh, the idea is that you get so much nice approach, so much uh, nice uh, data mining approaches, so much data, you just can get them together. And machine learning has been existing for a lot of time. Uh, educational data mining has been existing for a lot of time, but now we have a lot of data. And finally, machine learning meet education because the amount of data was sufficient for machine learning. And you can do a lot of exciting things. Uh, educational data mining conference has been there for more than 10 years. And uh, it's an amazing variety of work. There are also journals and then uh, uh, which focusing that things. And a lot of nice things. Just some examples. Could you mine uh, data on the level of courses, right? Not activities within courses, but courses. And we can find hidden prerequisites. We don't know that this course has to be taken before this, but whoever forgets to take that will fail the other one, right? So uh, we can figure out how to do it within the course. What is the best order to uh, offer you a problem uh, so that you can leverage uh, the, the right order and, and learn better? Or maybe what we can do if you fail, how we can help you better, what could be the best remedial activity. So all of that potentially could be discovered because almost everything is happening and we can connect what is happening to success. Uh, myself, I'm more interested in using uh, educational data mining for personalized learning. There is a lot of other usages. We can just think and discover what is there. It's interesting. But more interesting is to figuring out uh, how we can leverage this data uh, to do personalization. And it includes a range of things, better domain modeling, better student modeling. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, finding out what works best for different student categories. So trying to figure out how students are different and adapt to that direction of work. But it's not the only work. There is another uh, important direction uh, called visual learning analytics. And the idea behind that approach is think about people, not the machines. If we find a good way to show big educational data to humans, they can make some at least sense from this data themselves. And you can do it on multiple levels. The classic approach for visual learning analytics is show it to the uh, decision makers. Teach teachers, administrators, uh, presidents of the university so they can make decisions. But more and more work is focusing now on uh, visual learning analytics for students. Show to the students the results of kind of data processing the hope that they can do better. And indeed, it co co coincided very nicely with the rise of research on self-regulated learning. Students are in charge of their learning, but they need to be informed. They need to know what's happening. That's So this visual learning analytics and self-regulated learning really uh, go hand by hand. So we specifically try to work on things like uh, navigation, providing navigation support for students, although it's not the most popular work. So the more uh, people are focusing on helping uh, teachers and administrators because these guys have money, right? If you get some technology which hope helps university administration, you can get funded. And there is a lot of opening positions in the universities who get data miners in the hope that they can do something with huge volume of data accumulated by the university. So in our lab, uh, we do have work in both directions. So this is the link of, to, to our lab. So um, that's where you can find more information. I'll show also the link at the end. So what you can do, you can capture the screen and then um, try to navigate. So we do work on both educational data mining and visual learning analytics. And we do a range of different things, but it's impossible to show everything in just like 15 minutes lecture. And I hope that I have some time for questions afterwards. So I focus on one example on each of these groups. And uh, I'll start with the uh, more natural part. Uh, this is data mining, educational data mining. And I will focus on behavior mining, which is one of the possible direction of data mining. 
So what is this behavior mining about and uh, why people are working on that? That is a large stream of work right now. So I try to collect papers on the topic. I already get more than 50. And it was very thin stream uh, just like a few years ago because it's looking really exciting. And the main motivation for the behavior mining is the belief that there's a kind of Latin, Latin groups uh, in, in learning which are like-minded, similar in behavior, pretty much like peers in collaborative filtering. So they are, except that they don't have the same taste, but they're the same type of the behavior. And uh, as long as we find that Latin groups uh, and associate any student with that group, we can do something good about that. For example, we know how to help each group. Or we can uh, figure out that one group is at risk and if student associated with them, we'll take care of the students. So it was a very early idea at the time of MOOC. And it was a hope that that's exactly what can explain uh, dropouts, performance, and other things in MOOC. Uh, the early attempts has been done in 14, 2014, but early attempts were reasonably simplistic. So uh, they try to get the groups in a kind of predefined way. For example, demography. Could it be the demography? Maybe just like education level, maybe the place students are living. And there are some nice successes in that, but not something major. Partly not just the demography that matters. But of course, students with master's degrees learn better than students from high school, but that's obvious. Uh, so the other attempts were, again, done quite early. Um, and you see some really great people who did it. Uh, John Kleinberg and Yuri Leskov is working together. Uh, and the idea was to try to define some more or less obvious group by expert. Let's try to see, for example, how much students are solving problems. Fraction of assignments to all work. And we can divide students by those who do a lot of assignment, a little bit of assignment, or maybe how much people are using forums. And in fact, you can find differences. But it turns out that that is really simplistic. You just can't find some useful thing using these predefined groups. So the natural idea was, OK, we don't know how to define the groups. Let's find them out from data. We have a lot of data. Let's look at the data and somehow find that behavior patterns, uh, find uh, groups with similar behavior. And as long as we can do it, we can do cool things. For example, we can try to associate patterns of behavior uh, with retention or uh, with success or with whatever else. Even more, maybe we not just can predict, but maybe we can find a way to help best in students who exhibit different behavior. They're different. They might need different way to success. So treating everyone in the same way is not going to work. But if we can find it Latin groups, even we now to which Latin group every student behaves, things will be really nice and peachy. So the only trouble is how we can find that patterns. So that's exactly what this work uh, is currently trying to do. And there is a lot of different varieties of work. So basically, the, the simple ideas are kind of simple. So the, what you can do really easily, you can behave, encode student behavior in the course as a vector. And for example, you can represent the frequency of using forms, the frequency of solving problems. There could be some easier solutions. Uh, but you can do it a bit more complicated. So that is balance activity by type. You can think balance by time. For example, we can try to define vector activity for every course week. Then we can discover that students work less or more. Or you can do even smarter. It may be not the activity themselves matter, but maybe the transitions. Are you going after failing to solve a problem? Are you going back to the lecture? And watch it, or you just like try the problem again. Uh, so, and well, that is the way to find vectors. And using vectors, of course, we can throw some grouping and find the patterns. So, the majority of work doing exactly that. They first try to define some vectors, and then they try to do some kind of grouping. And it could be hard clustering or soft clustering, which is matrix factorization or tensor factorization. And there are lots of examples in both directions. But there are more work which trying to think that the situation might be more complex. And uh, the more complex approaches are, for example, using Markov models, trying to predict uh, a model and predict the sequence of actions, or using the sequence mining, trying to find frequent sequences and do something with that. So that is the overview. What we're working on, actually, across the spectrum, we do matrix factorization and vector uh, uh, 
a, a tensor factorization, whatever. But I think I present you the most exciting part, which really working for us like magic in, in multiple different domains. So hopefully that might be useful uh, for some of you as well. This approach uh, uh, we call a genome. Uh, first time we discovered that uh, lo looking at the student problem solving. And we call it problem solving genome. But now we have like 10 different types of genomes. Uh, and what does really make it different from other uh, attempts? Uh, we uh, put a lot of care to, to see that we're finding not the flukes, not something random, but really some stable characteristic of users. And uh, using problems, problem uh, sequence mining, we really can find stable patterns. And that's the only, the only approach so far that works uh, for stability. So our motivation was to try to find uh, individual differences which could be applied for online learning. I worked before on individual differences, but it was kind of classic individual differences. You give students a bunch of questionnaires and then you decide that, okay, these are field dependent or these are field independent. Or, well, there are things which is now really out of fashion called learning styles, visual or verbal, right? So some of the things that kind of turns out to be hoax, but some of them really reliably work before online learning. But most of the approaches to uh, find differences in the old good way in online learning was not really very successful. You find out that, that there's uh, field dependent and field independent, and it turns out it doesn't matter at all. Uh, so it doesn't define what the students do, and it doesn't very much define success, and you can't find out how to help one group or another. So we follow the same basic premise. Students are different, and if they're different, they showed it by the behavior. And if they're different from the prospect of online learning, their behavior in online learning should show the difference. Uh, so, well, we try to find this difference from data. And that is a very nice and straightforward example to present it. What we deal with, uh, with is some interesting differences in student problem solving. And uh, I'm talking about very unusual type of problem solving, parameterized problems. So these are, you can see an example of that. It's a parameterized problems for Java. In Java programming, uh, you in other kind of programming, you need to uh, trace program behavior. So that is the idea of the problem. You have a, a piece of code and your goal is to find the final value uh, of a variable or what is being printed. Very standard type of problem. But in our case, they were parameterized. That means you can try the same problem again and it will be looking different. You can see on the left, uh, the problem has the pattern uh, eight and on the right, it is six. There are very small changes, but it actually works the way that the problem is different. Same solution is not gonna work. And we find out that students exhibit very different behavior in uh, working with these parameterized problems. And we thought maybe this is something we can look at and make sense of that. It might be used for personalization. And we, well, since it wasn't all in the sequences, we decided to try to do sequence mining in that case. So we, so this work is uh, uh, presenting some of one of our first attempts. Uh, we get large data set with uh, over hundreds of exercises and lots of students' attempts because we use it in multiple different classes. So there are several thousand attempts both correct and incorrect. Um, and now there's a real change. In sequence mining, you need to figuring out how to create the sequences and how to do the labeling. So what we did, we decided that it's a making a difference whether you succeed or fail, but also it makes a difference whether you have been trying hard or not. So we split all of the success or failures uh, by median to distinguish short successes and long successes, short success and, long, and uh, short failures and long failures. And we also recognize that it might be nice to understand where students stop working on a specific uh, type of uh, patterns or when students start. So we created this kind of a pseudo uh, activity, which means starting a sequence of ending a sequence. As a result, all student attempts on one problem uh, form a sequence and we have a beginning and the end. And then pretty much like uh, everyone else who is using sequence mining, we use uh, uh, spam algorithm to find most uh, frequent sequences and then we retain the more typical ones, the most frequent ones uh, with a specific level of support. In our case, it was 1%. Just to make sure what you see, what I understand, uh, these are the typical sequences. 
So for example, that is short, uh, short success. It means kind of easy for students to do. Another short success, and this is it. They then move to the next problem. Or maybe thinking hard and fail, thinking hard and fail. So uh, the typical approach to use uh, this uh, sequential patterns is to look at two different groups of learners and try to find out which frequencies are different. Let's look at good students and bad students. The problem with that is that each individual pattern makes not very much sense because it's all maybe just at random, not exactly at random, but more maybe a matter of chance. So we try to do something which is really more stable. So we decided to represent student behavior not as a just uh, one pattern, but as a whole uh, set of my frequent micro patterns. So that is a kind of every micro pattern becomes a position in the vector. So unlike uh, other approaches which create vectors from how many times you use a form, we created a vector which shows how many times you were exhibiting a specific micro pattern frequent micro pattern. So as a result, we get a vector uh, which has, a, uh, in our case, 102 uh, positions. Uh, and each of them represent a specific pattern, just like one of this. And we show in the position of the vector, what is the student frequency of using this pattern. We believe that altogether, if you look at the student across multiple patterns, that should become reasonably stable. Every single pattern, maybe not, but altogether, as a whole, that should be stable. And so we kind of decided, uh, motivated by the stability of the genome, we decided to call this pattern is a, a genome. So every uh, small pattern is a gene, uh, and altogether they form this kind of a, a vector. What was, well, it's kind of easy to say, but we try multiple different attempts. But when we get to that, we get a really good success. So. Uh, and because what we built, so this is an example of building a genome, and you can read uh, here uh, it, it more about, about that in more details. Uh, it turns out the genome is stable, uh, that really reliably representing the user. So uh, while every using of every single pattern is not stable, but as a whole genome is stable, how we can find that? So we find it in two different ways. So one way we decided to split student work with multiple problems in two parts, in two halves, randomly, right? So half of the problems uh, are used to create genome uh, in one way for the student and half in another way. So our genome is stable if student behavior in each half is about the same, right? Uh, so uh, with whichever we divide the problems, they, they, they behave stably. And how we can check it? Well, if we get all of these half genomes in the big head or ball and uh, try to get one, they hope that the, the other half of the genome of the same uh, per person, the same student, will be significantly closer to the first half than everything else. So can we take half a genome and find another half? Turns out, yes, we can. It's a significantly, uh, the other half of genome is significantly close to its, its uh, mate uh, than to genomes of other students. They really stable and they really distinguish students. Even when we try it in a different way, uh, when we divided student work in the course into halves by time, right? First time of the uh, first part of the course, second part of the course, genome was still quite stable. The difference between student behavior in the first part of the course was still larger uh, from the second part of the course than two randomly split parts. Students do change the behavior a little bit over the course, but it still was far, far closer to the other half than to genomes of other students. So that is really proving for us that what we find out some reliable representation of the learner. And as long as we have reliable representation of the learner, now we can implement that long-term idea uh, of data mining and pattern mining, find this Latin groups by clustering. And we try multiple different uh, ways of clustering and it turns out that uh, the best way to cluster for us was spectral approach, which is really a tough way of clustering. And um, you know, we try my multiple other approaches and sometimes we need to change, but overall uh, spectral cluster works really the best. Um, and the, the best number of clusters most of the time was two. So most of the time students were reasonably well split into groups and also two is the easiest to understand. So I'll show you uh, more than one example, but that is the uh, 
work on the original uh, cluster with a reasonably simple case of parameterized problems. So what we have here is uh, the top uh, uh, the top genes, and uh, we can see the frequency average frequency of uh, uh, application of these genes uh, in these two cluster, which we call cluster one and cluster two. They are specifically ordered by divergence, so they we're trying to maximize the differences uh, be between the clusters. And you can see there is reasonable differences on two sides. And then uh, on the right side, uh, this is a, a behavior very much dominated in cluster one and much less pronounced in cluster two. Uh, these students have surprisingly large number of success repetitions. They succeed on doing the problem and they keep doing that. Well, it's kind of, you can understand it if they succeed uh, and it was really hard. That was hard to think. Then they try the same problem again with different parameters. Again, thought hard. Well, you really need to confirm that you can do it. But look, we have even more frequent was this one, four short successes. Why are you doing that, right? If it's easy for you to solve the problem, why are you trying to solve it again and then again and again? Well, uh, uh, that actually positive reflects. If you remember Pavlov experiment that this uh, with, with rats and dogs, well, it looks nice when you solve a problem. Why don't you just do it again? It's not educationally valuable for you. You're not learning much anymore, but you're getting this kind of self gratification. On the other, on the other side, where students were kind of called quitters, they don't practice very much. If they fail and they succeed, this is it. They drop. They don't want to, to write again. Well, the, it was a hard success, right? They have to think, but yeah, they don't want to uh, try again with different parameters. They instead they, they they ending the that's what this underscore means. They ended the trial right away, and that's the more diversion behavior. So that was kind of interesting, and uh, of course the very nice uh, hypothesis was, okay, which of this behavior is really good and which is bad. That was the uh, core assumption of this behavior mining. We find Latin groups and we will figure it out. One group is good, one is bad. But in almost all of our attempts, and by the way, in the attempts of others, it turns out not to be the case. The life is a bit more complicated. So the uh, indeed, the groups are different, but in fact, we can find good students in each of the groups. These are just two different ways to do the things, two different ways to practice, two different ways to learn. And you can succeed in each of them within this group. Yet, what was really interesting uh, is uh, the attempt to find out in uh, each of these clusters where the good and where the bad students are located. And what we find out is really interesting. Uh, it turns out that uh, the good and bad students in each clusters exhibit that polar behavior, right? They, they do much more of this uh, self-gratification or quitting, but uh, the uh, extremal activity uh, where we have more self gratification and more quitting is actually not educationally beneficial. Strong students in each cluster kind of closer to each other. They not overdo in self gratification and they don't overdo in quitting. They still learn differently. So that was really interesting. And it shows that it's very tough to, uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, find an easy approach. Uh, to, to success. If you see that the student is a quitter, or this, uh, for example, he is a, a try to, to solve the problem, succeed and quit. It's not actually clear, is it good or bad? Because it depends who the student is. So if the student is a quitter, generally, and uh, if he succeed the problem once and quit, that's bad, right? We probably need to encourage them to try it once again. But if the student is self gratificator which is kind of solving it well again and again, and then when the student suddenly quits without doing self-gratification. That's actually good behavior, right? So personalization is really more complicated. Find a student, find a group, and well, so you can classify students into groups, and then you potentially need to work with the groups differently. Um, so that was one of the first attempts. Um, we did a lot of other works in uh, mining behavior. Uh, with, with uh, frequent sequences, I just can't present all of this work just to show at least one more so you can understand that this approach could be reasonably uh, general. 
And again, the idea is the same. Uh, you build sequences, you identify patterns, and you can do it from pretty much any type of student work, right? Um, so this is another attempt uh, to try to find difference in, between students in uh, submitting pr computer programming assignments. And we, we found a difference there by uh, the fact how much changes the students do between uh, submitting and do they fail or succeed when they submit. And there are really, again, we find two reasonably polar behavior. In that case, uh, we call them tinkerers uh, and, and movers. Uh, and it, uh, what we find out that uh, those who we call movers, or we can call them thinkers, uh, they do a lot of changes uh, in their code before submitting it again. On the other hand, tinkerers do very small changes uh, and then submit it again for, uh, for evaluation. So that's kind of a different way of work. Uh, in that case, uh, we also can see that uh, that might not really benefit uh, to students. So generally, tinkerers are very less efficient, right? So thinkers were generally more efficient. Uh, yet, uh, yet, there are good people among tinkerers, and then there were bad people among thinkers. So just the fact, uh, just the pattern of your problem solving doesn't just tell you, are you good or bad? And yet, within each group, we can distinguish low and high performers. And that's the kind of situation which we're getting uh, uh, time and again. And we have a range of other attempts to do the sequence mining, but please read the papers. I really recommend you to do that because we already tried with uh, several different domains with like four or five collaborators. And for almost every application, we can find a way uh, where we can find clear Latin groups, uh, which are really uh, different in their behavior and in their performance. So that might find uh, help you to find the hidden regularities. All right, and uh, now uh, a bit more of the other approach. So that idea is to use past learner data to augment humans. And this idea came from uh, actually the idea of social navigation. Social navigation is reasonably old uh, approach, and I'm, I'll, I'll tell you about that. It's trying to help users to navigate in large information space. Uh, and exactly what the students generally need in the situation of e-learning. So the students, if they have a lot of learning content, they need to know when is the right thing to try something, when is the wrong thing. And online learning tends to show everything to the student at the same time. They can do pretty much everything. They can start working on each topic. They can go to every type of content. It's not always good. So navigation support should help students to figure out what you should do right now. Uh, the classic approach to navigation is personalization. You model student knowledge, and you use it to decide what is the next best thing. But it's very expensive. So social navigation leverages data for the past users. So I can show you a very simple case first. That is our old system, which is called Knowledge C. And here we try to guide learners to the right uh, reading uh, page uh, uh, on, well, on multiple domains. That one is C programming, but also we did it for uh, information travel and several other domains. And the situation is there are lots of uh, uh, online um, materials which students can read. Which of them is good for the class, which is bad, which is good now, and which is not. But let's try to see what other students are doing. So this is a way to build a map of all information about uh, C programming and try to show you where you are trying to work and where the class. Your work is indicated by the uh, color of your human figure. The work of the class indicated by the color of background. So you can see the situation for example, where is the uh, dark background, like your class is working on that, but you are uh, represented by the white figure, you're not. On the other hand, there are places where everyone is doing a lot of work, the class and you as well. So it's really just processing large volume of data, a little bit smart processing, because we need to figure out what exactly is going to be done, because the goal of the class is changing, the class is moving on. But other than that, it's reasonably straightforward. And within every, as we call it, cell, there could be multiple types of learning resources. And again, for every learning resource, we can tell to what extent your class is using that and to what extent you are doing that. Right? And you can find the difference and you can make decisions. That's a navigation support. They don't tell you anything. Right? Uh, go there. No, 
But you can see that like a lot of people in your class are looking at that page, function calls, and you never try that. Maybe it's time to do it, maybe not. And again, this navigation support continues when you dive in the book. So that was our first attempt. And that actually was really working very well. But I just want to show that because it's simple. Uh, what we're doing right now is more complicated. Uh, and the reason we try to do it more complicated is that just showing you navigation data is not reliable, as we find out. Because student may uh, click for different reasons. And in that case, uh, while altogether it makes sense, there is still a chance to make an error. Because if everyone go to some nice uh, page and getting uh, blur and blur, and that's a, a, the effect of avalanche. And this way, it's very easy to create a tar pit, place where uh, students get as a mistake. So we need to get some more reliable evidence that is a good thing for students or not. And we can do it by uh, using so-called open social student modeling, open social learning modeling. Uh, this idea based on the work on so-called open learning modeling. The idea is to show learning models to the students. And the learning model usually shows student uh, performance by topics, by concepts, uh, and the student can kind of look at that and see where they are. But social learning modeling trying to combine social uh, uh, social evidence, how other students are doing, and your own work. And instead of doing on the number of clicks, it's doing it by knowledge gained. And knowledge gain are assessed uh, by reasonably reliable technologies. So it's not how many other people click and how many times you click, but it's really how many, much knowledge they gain and how much knowledge you gain. So uh, we tried that approach in multiple different systems, uh, but I just show again one system only, and that system called Master Grids. Uh, Master Grids uh, is, is our current platform. It has been developed uh, five years ago, but we're modifying that and using it for reasonably large scale studies. And you're really welcome if you're interested uh, to collaborate with us on that. Uh, so that is Master Grids. And that's uh, kind of easy to say what is the open learning model. Uh, so here is the course representation. And we present a course in a reasonably coarse grain uh, uh, representation. So every uh, column is a topic. And this is again Java programming course. This is variables, primitive data types, constants, kind of loops, objects, classes. The color represents uh, your performance on the topic. That means how much you potentially learn by working on multiple types of content. I don't want to deal with content types just to make the situation simple. So that is your performance. And this is the performance uh, you're on multiple other type of activities. So this is your performance overall. This is how you do on uh, quizzes. This is how you do in examples. So for every type of learning content, we can try and see how you can do. But we also can integrate it together. So the showing uh, amount of work for different types of content, we find it important because uh, it's frequently students ignore one type of content. And we want them to, to see that. Right. You see, you, you think you did everything? No, look, no animated examples, right? So, uh, and of course, as you can guess, the idea of social uh, navigation support is pretty much the same thing, social comparison, trying to see how much you are different from the rest of the class. So this is your overall performance in, in blue, uh, in green. This is overall performance of your peer group, for example, the whole class. And this is the row which is trying to show difference. If it's kind of green, then you are ahead of the class. It's blue, then class is ahead of you. Uh, and the scale of the color indicate the difference. We also have bar charts, but it's easier to present that, uh, the colors uh, in a talk. So uh, now we can see, in fact, that on some topics you're doing really well. You're going slightly ahead of the class, sometimes very much ahead of the class. But on a number of topics, you're really well behind. And again, nothing else but think about maybe you should be there maybe you shouldn't if you know what you're doing fine if you don't uh, think about changing your behavior if you like to get more detailed picture you can compare yourself with other peers line by line so these are other individual students and you can see where you are in your position in the class well there are some more complicated things for example we can present comparison uh, with other students by all type of content but that's hard to explain 
So uh, our hope that uh, with social navigation support, students should get a reasonable encouragement of doing the, uh, the work, but they also might work more reliably because they are focusing on the topics which are just in the right time for them. If they see that uh, uh, they are lagging behind or they are ready to, 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 to jump on the topic, but not on every topic. And it's also help you to decide uh, what you should do depending on the situation. One situation is you just practicing in the middle of the class and one you try to get ready to do the exam. So it turns out that the system was supporting all of the approaches. So we'll try to find how much that uh, visual learning analytics just showing you the performance of other students and your peer group uh, comparing it with yours can help you. So we did a bunch of different studies, but that was one of our uh, oldest studies and, and, and well published. So let me show you that. So in this case, we try to get uh, to compare the work of two groups. In one group, uh, only individual model was shown. In another group, they can see the social model, the work of the other students. And we try to see to what extent it makes a difference. And it turns out that uh, it does create amazing difference. In a group with uh, open social uh, modeling, students did a much larger volume of work of all type. You can see, for example, topic coverage. It's a fraction of topic which students explored. From the standard situation 19, and if you only see what you're doing, you can see which topics are missing, but only can cover 90%. If you see where others are going, you tend to cover almost 60% of the topics. Number of attempts, how many times you try to solve the problem, it's almost four time increase. And so almost everything else was, was reasonably uh, larger. So students did more work. And I explained you why it is actually important. So far, beer with me, they did more work. And uh, now, uh, is it just the amount of work? What was really interesting, uh, the navigation support also worked. Navigation support is supposed to do students not just to do more work, they learn better. And we found out with uh, open social uh, modeling, uh, students work more efficiently. So we have several different measures of efficiency and that actually uh, work quite nicely. So they try, they can gain larger, uh, they can achieve larger gain uh, by investing less efforts, which was good. So that means they were getting to the right activities in the right time. Uh, and uh, well, the, what we started with is the dropout rate. Well, it turns out that uh, retention of the students is really much higher. What is really interesting that even from the start, the number of students who decided to use the system was remarkably different. And we, it was two different groups, uh, two independent classes, and we'll show you a demo. We show them in one class, which show that you can see yourself, and we show them another class that you see yourself and you see the group. Uh, and even from the very start, almost 80% of students decided to try this social system, and basically about 30 only tried the other version. And even if you uh, try to compare them by percentage, not by the starting level, you can see that uh, the student lose interest in using the system much faster if they have no social part. Well, it's not surprising. We are social uh, animals, I would say. So we like to be with others. What others are doing is important for us. And they're just making it more interesting if there are other people in the system and we can see how they behave. So retention, as you can see, is, is, is really much better uh, in that case. So now, uh, why, in fact, uh, that is important? Efficiency, yeah, that's clear, right? You learn better. But why it is really important that students do more work? And the point here is that we work with so-called practice system, free practice system. Free practice system is a way from my prospect is to bridge the gap between strong and weak students. Course supposed to treat everyone in the same way uh, and grade everyone in the same way. You have five problems to solve and you get a grade. The trouble is that weaker students with less preparation, they need to solve 25 problems, not five. And the strongest students may just need to solve one or two. And there is no space for that in a regular class. So what usually is being done, the professors uh, or instructors uh, sh uh, put additional learning material. And they say, use that and you will learn, right? Especially use it if you're really not good yet. And what is happening? Well, there are a bunch of studies. Nothing, nothing is happening. It's kind of nice to use that, but why? There's so many nice things to do. 
Uh, but it turns out when you provide that navigation support, show what other people are doing, you starting in that non-mandatory system with three times larger chance, and you keep working in this system, it just completely free, just for yourself, much more. So, and I think that's really important because a lot of uh, online content right now is really that kind of practice content. You use it because you interested in that, but unless you get some extra motivation, you might not. Uh, that's it. Uh, so I uh, just want to say that uh, Master Grids is, is, is a system which you can try for yourself. We get, get a bunch of courses for Java, Python, and SQL. And uh, we are happy to partner with people who are interested to run studies in all of these domains with this open social modeling. There are a lot of uh, different topics we'd like to explore there. So of course, it's not all that we're doing on this visual analytics and social navigation. So this is the uh, other work. And uh, uh, I will release the slides of the talk online and I uh, shared the link so you can really look at that uh, later on. And of course, you can get access to the presentation, I hope, uh, online. So make take a note of that thing. So this is other ideas of using uh, uh, visual analytics. And again, while I talk on both directions, machine learning, educational data mining, and visual analytics, that was uh, just a part of our work on data-driven learning. Uh, data-driven learning, I think, is excited, it's exciting things. And we do works on several other topics. We try to do domain modeling, trying to find main concepts and topics in the domain using large volume of data. We try to build better student models by, uh, again, using large volume of data. Uh, so we try to extract uh, semantics from every piece of learning content, and we use it for multiple reasons. And so it's kind of really exciting times. For, from my prospect is that we're entering the age where education become hard science. So in some sense, physics become hard science where Galileo decided to drop uh, the, the cannonball and the uh, musket bullet from a peasant tower, right? That's what the legend says. Before that, you can speculate and think uh, and hypothesize. And whoever is thinking better and arguing better is the winner. So, but then at the end, what matters is what really ha happens. You can start doing experiments. You collect data, analyze the data, and you learn the laws. So what's happening with learning right now is pretty much what's happening in, with physics uh, from the time of Galileo to Newton. We start collecting data, we start processing data, and we learn how things operate, how planets moves, uh, right? how the gravity works. And what is happening right now in the learning is just the same thing. Apparently, humans are a bit more complicated than planets. We need to collect more data. Uh, we need to get more ideas, but it's moving on. So education is now science. That's exciting times. Uh, so I wanted to finish in 15 minutes. So I'm almost there. So these are my collaborators, uh, my former students and visitors. So one of the, uh, so for example, Rafael, uh, they said here at the end, this was one our visitor from Brazil and he was working with us on uh, sequence mining. And this has been supported by a, a range of different grants. And so um, if, if this is kind of interesting thing for you, uh, come uh, visit us, but all of the things uh, end Travel will get uh, possible again. So Sarbajot already wanted to visit us, sure. Not everything is so peachy in Pittsburgh, uh, just the cathedral of learning. So just like normal people are living in normal houses. And this is my, my, my team with a bunch of different visitors. And this is our farewell to Rafael, who is uh, uh, going back to Brazil after staying with us. And if you can't visit us for now, at least, uh, you can read our papers. And now I have 10 minutes for questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Uh, amazing um, talk. Thank you. Um, lots of ideas, um, uh, you know, that uh, have been sparked by this, uh, because obviously with the COVID, we've had to move our training program also online, whereas it was completely face to face. And I think um, in many ways for people like you who are innovating in the education space, uh, this has been a boon, right? I mean, COVID has probably created so much more data than we could have indeed. possibly ever got before. Indeed, um, indeed, right, yeah. So, I mean, you know, a number of years ago, we had been asked to create uh, uh, an adaptive learning engine. You know, everybody, the buzzword in, in industry is uh, adaptive learning. 
Um, and, uh, you know, coming from a recommender systems background, uh, you know, we started looking at how we could apply collaborative filtering and, and, and content based filtering and very quickly realized what you were talking here that, uh, you know, prerequisite knowledge and the dependencies between concepts are so important that a lot of those algorithms don't work very well, or at least that was our experience. And, uh, you know, we had to look at uh, much more structured information and rather than just looking at a purely data driven discovery, there is a domain uh, modeling side that was important. Would you concur with that? Or do you think, uh, you know, we can actually extract and I, I see you were you were talking about domain modeling through a data driven approach here. Do you think there is a role uh, for, you know, both here where we bring in the domain modeled in some way and then interpret the data uh, in much more robust ways, or do you think that uh, it can all be data driven? Uh, yeah, I, I think getting a little bit more semantics and domain modeling might help quite enormously because otherwise there is just too much freedom in the data. And the main trouble with using traditional recommender system is that students, learners are changing way too much in the educational process. So you solve the problem correctly and some other students fail on that. Does it make you peers? Well, it all depends where you are and where this person are. You might solve 20 problems before that. It was a piece of, piece of cake for you. And he, it was for him as the first problem. And also uh, your knowledge are changing all the time. So if, if you solve the problem right now, it's one thing. If you solve it once again uh, in, in two weeks, that's another thing. And it's hard to represent that, uh, that uh, uh, unless we get a little bit more knowledge about what's happening and understanding that in education, we get a bunch of concepts which are learning, right? And equating learners not only just by their clicks, but maybe by levels of their knowledge, and maybe by knowledge of different concepts. That might be more a bit more productive. So we've been trying to use a, a matrix factorization and tensor factorization to do just like that. But that's really hard. So because mm -hmm. It's not that easy for people from classic data mining because usually they don't understand recommender systems, but neither is good for people from recommender system field because they don't quite understand education. So I think that we need to create a bunch of people who educated on both sides. So one of my students, uh, Sherry Sahibi, she's a professor in Albany right now. Uh, she combines these two different expertise uh, levels. So she's trained as a classic recommender system person, yet uh, um, nice recommender system papers at Rexis, but now she's focusing her work on e-learning and trying to do something. And we need more people like that. And the programs like yours might really uh, remarkably help to create people who educated on both sides. Sure, because we ended up, you know, using uh, you know Bayesian belief networks there, and you know, modeling the dependencies between concepts and and built something. But one of the problems that we realized then was, uh, which I think was realized a long time ago in, when we were talking about intelligent tutoring systems that this kind of modeling is, is uh, difficult firstly, and then also very time consuming, um, you know, yeah. because it's domain dependent. Now, what I saw with your presentations was a lot of the presentations were around programming exercises. Um, you know, how difficult is it to take what you've done here and uh, look at a different uh, domain? Uh, oh, well, in fact, it's vice versa. The majority of work on educational data mining is uh, happening in the fields like mathematics and uh, geometry and genomics, which are very simple. Right. In fact, I'm working on programming, not just because it's uh, something which is very easy for me to teach, but because it's a more challenging thing. So mm -hmm. The majority of fields where ITS, intelligent tutoring system, were created are the fields where you can build a domain expert who can right. solve the problem for you. But in fact, if we can solve a problem for you, do we really need an expert in the field to be prepared? So we need to prepare experts who can solve problems which machines can solve that easily. So it's, it's not as clearly defined domains. And programming, computer science education is closed. We can do some simple things, but still computers can write code that easily. So that is actually a complicated domain. Other domains are sure. considerably simple. Of course, dancing, for example, right? That might be challenging. But 
Right, right. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting programming is easier. I was just saying that the concepts that you've done here and, and, and developed, can it be moved to other domains easier yeah, than, you know, domain-based uh, approaches that are... Uh, all of the approaches are, are working across domains, but again, as I say, programming is in fact the most complicated case among all of the yeah. domains which people mm -hmm. do in educational data mining. It's the most complicated. As a result, the majority of work try to do something easier. Algebra, geometry, easy, easy targets. And also they yeah. tend to be better find it in the past. Mm -hmm. So programming is hard, but what we learn in programming can be moved to multiple different domains. Right. There's a question here from Puneet. Uh, he says, is gamification of learning process uh, and course uh, one of the reasons of better performance of OSSM versus OSM? Uh, well, I mean, you're just trying to call the same important phenomena, which is known as social comparison in different ways. So gamification is one set of techniques, which in fact using social comparison. So it's not gamification, right? The root is social comparison and gamification with all of these leaderboards, they exactly using social comparison, right? Mm -hmm. so we're not exactly using gamification, but we're using social comparison for a different way, right? And okay, in that case, we, we compare, uh, it's not exactly gamification because we're trying to compare student knowledge. And that's a, it's kind of really hard about well, gamification, trying to compare uh, things like performance and activities. And that, that's, right. that's making it slightly different. But of course, that's, you can use a lot of other ideas from the field of gamification. Open, but open student models were around much longer than gamification. So the first work on that field started in, 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 in the 90s, right? when all of this gamification has not been there yet. Right, right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, looking at the graphs and the discussion you had around the tinkerers and the movers, it sounded like uh, you know those two groups were one group that was trying to pass the test versus another group that was actually trying to validate their understanding of concepts. Would you say that that's a good mapping between uh, these uh, groups, or am I missing something? Well, here? no, 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 no. That was a, that was really. Uh, I think it was on one hand more complicated, on the other hand easier. It's not a test. They need to write reasonably complex programs, submit to automatic grading, which is done by unit testing. And then uh, it's either, either right or wrong, and they can do it again. A lot right. of uh, learning programming is, is working on right now. But what is really amazing is that the same activity is done in multiple different ways, right? Students have very different ways of achieving the goals. And it turns mm -hmm. out some of the ways are not very beneficial. Some of them, some of the ways are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it's, re it's related to the goal. Okay. It's so really, it's yeah, it's really the way you do things, but why? I don't know why, but at least we can model that. We, we can distinguish the users. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and finally, Peter, uh, when I, I look at, you know, a lot of what has been discussed here is all about students trying to solve problems. But of course, we can track them even with their engagement in content, right, that is yeah, provided yeah. online. Uh, how does that uh, knit into the kind of analysis that you are doing, or how would you include, uh, you know, actual uh, we're, consumption we're, yeah, of metrics? We're, we're doing a lot of work. If you if you look at uh, some of our approaches, we we uh, try to look at the student behavior in the reading, for example. So mm -hmm. it works in all places. Uh, it just the more reliable are the results of the behavior, the more reliable is the the decision. When students solve a problem, doesn't solve a problem, it's a clear difference. But it's much harder to identify a difference when students say reading a text or looking at the worked out example. And as a result, whatever we do can be used with both problem solving and examples and readings, but the power of decision support becomes lower, right? Mm -hmm. So we can build reliable student modeling by observing how they solve problems. And we can build student modeling by observing how they read. But the mm -hmm. models built from the problem solving behavior are more reliable. And there is right. nothing we can do about it because the diversity is very large between users and uh, there could be different factors. Very hard to say, you spend 10 minutes on the page. What we can say about that? Well, not much. Although we can do smart mining approaches, look at your, all your history, look at your rate of page length to your speed. Yeah, but e even with that, it's not as reliable as evidence of anything as the fact that you solve the problem correctly, especially if it's a hard problem, not a multiple choice question, question when you can just guess. So it is generalizable. It's just easier and nicer 
at least to do the discoveries based on problems and then try to move these technologies and ideas to less reliable domains like working on examples and doing the readings. Right, because the behavior that students uh, portray on our platform, for example, they may ask questions, other students may answer those questions, and there's a lot of different engagement type of data. I mean, it would be interesting to, uh, you know, maybe have an offline discussion with you in terms of how we can take all of these aspects to try and build up uh, better engagement uh, metrics, right? We are also uh, on online note taking that students do. How do we utilize that to kind of also understand to what extent they're really perceiving what is being taught and Absolutely. looking at that. And again, I'm sure you've done work in this and that's why I thought I'd bring this up. And uh, Yeah, that know. is note taking. For example, we can use note taking behavior as evidence of social activities. So one thing is that students were there clicking there, but another uh, case that some of the students in the class uh, left annotation on a specific page. It's a very strong sign of uh, page interesting, interestingness, right? So yeah, we definitely can leverage all type of behavior, but we still need to learn how to do it. And that's what is this large field is doing, learning analytics and educational data mining. And if you're thinking about data mining as a field, that might be great application field where you where there's a lot of needs and you're doing uh, good things for the social so the show good because you help people learn right right uh, there's a question by uh, Niharika Niharika do you want to just um, uh, unmute and ask this question actually you'll do a better job than me trying to rephrase it uh, not at all <laughs> hello good morning everyone so it's a uh, small question around uh, so there could be different models working individually let's say uh, one model addresses the understanding of a student on linear algebra. The other might be on geometry. So there might be some common concepts. There might be some commonalities between different models. Uh, so oh, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, any, yeah. So any thoughts on uh, how to model that? Uh, what are let's say the commonalities between different models to get an overall understanding of the student, or what are the weak points of a student? And how well, do we do it more skillfully? Uh, so that is a great idea. So there is very little work on that topic. There is work, but very little. Um, we have some early work on that, trying to see student transitions from the courses on C programming to the courses of Java, for example, because C loop is not exactly the same as Java loop, but it is very similar. Even now, student knowledge on C, can we help to model student knowledge of Java without getting so much information? The only trouble with that is it requires even more elaborated domain modeling. We need to model two domains and we need to figure out on how to connect them. But again, data comes to the, to the rescue. In the past, it all was done by trying to do expert models, right? Two experts created the model of two domains, they connected that. But now we can try to derive that from data. We can compare a student performance and do courses in parallel. They learn algebra and let's say they're learning programming. So can we connect their performance and behavior in one course and another? So we potentially can create linkage between two domains automatically from data. And there's a great idea, but I know almost no work on that. So if you want to do some interesting thing, that may be something to explore. Yes, and, and Niharika actually does have a very strong uh, interest in this area. Uh, I know that for a fact and uh, actually wants to go and do a PhD in, in um, uh, education and, and uh, the role of that AI can play. Uh, so thank you for taking that question. And Niharika, you should connect with Peter, uh, you know, and, and see the right. possibilities there. Uh, Anupriya, you've got a question and we'll use that as the last question because I know it's past 11 o'clock for Peter. So um, do you want to just unmute and ask your question as well? Right, thank you. So, um, so the, one of the difference between uh, you know online and offline learning is that in offline learning, we uh, or colleges have a lot of data about students' past performance. Right, what uh, what degrees or what courses they've come from, how they have performed on those courses. So they have hard data. Whereas in online courses, those those kind of data is very limited. So, uh, does that past performance have an impact on you know online? Uh, I would say performance of students, or does it get modeled in any way, or is it not relevant in online? Oh, you kind of answered your question partially. Indeed, uh, when we would deal with online learning, especially MOOCs and other kind of things, we have very limited context. Students came uh, to MOOC with a very large baggage of knowledge, but we have no idea what this knowledge are. And it's related to the question of Niharika. Even now, what knowledge they have before, 
what what domain we potentially can connect it, right? But it's it's quite a changing thing. On the other hand, it turns out in most of the cases, uh, uh, the domain is not that strongly related. So we don't need concept by concept, uh, your knowledge concept by concept in biology, right? To figuring out how you know the programming. But overall expertise, some kind of meta knowledge that might be very, very useful to know and very important. And we know that one of the largest differentiate, differentiate, differentiates in, in learning is your starting level of knowledge and awareness. But that one you can model. You can model it because you can do a pretest. Uh, and once you do the pretest, you understand are the students strong or weak, and they also understand where the weaknesses are. And it's amazing that even a very simple pretest, like 10 uh, questions, can very reliably distinguish students by their potential and also kind of delegate them in, in two different ways. And of course, if you can get this data from student past performance, like what is his average score in algebra? Yeah, you don't ever need to do a pretest. So that is really a, a treasure of data. But as more universities are moving online, this online and history are coming together, right? Our university is now completely learning online. So it's online, but we still remember what the students do. So now everyone is doing a MOOC in some sense, but we just need to figure out how to best leverage this data, just better than average score in the math classes. That is useful. Can we do better? So that's another very exciting topic, which was not really easy to explore before. Now we're getting data. So I'm sure that people will start looking at that opportunities. So good question. Thank you very much. So thank you, Peter. Um, it was wonderful to hear your thoughts on, on the subject. Um, and um, I uh, hope we will have the opportunity to invite you back sometime to talk about some of the other research that you haven't. You have a wealth of knowledge. Um, and we hope that we'll have an opportunity to, for you to share that with us again. My pleasure. Well, so thank you very much for inviting. And uh, uh, I'll hope to attend some of your future talks. Lovely. Thank you so much, Peter. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm stopping my share.